the season. Hopefully you can see me and hear me. Um, before we crack on, we better just check that. So um, if you could just type something into the chat box to say, uh, yes, you can see me and yes, you can hear me. And I'll just double check that to make sure that we're we are technically good to go. Okay, great. Um, I think there's a slight lag on the line, so um, apologies if there's a few seconds uh, hiatus there. Um, the purpose of the this session is really not to talk so much about um, GGs, but rather to talk about you um, and how you bet and um, maybe to uh, kind of get a bit of context, a bit of helicopter in from the top, think about where we are now. Um, when I was when I was thinking about this introduction, I, I was reminded of the the very famous saying "Know thyself," and I went googling the etymology of it. And apparently, and you'll have to bear with me while I read this off a bit of paper, it's one of the three maxims on the forecourt of the Temple of Apollo of Delphi. Um, now that's <laughs> neither here nor there. But what was quite interesting to me, I thought, was that um, all three of the maxims were pretty appropriate to racing, really. So as well as know thyself, there's also nothing in excess and surety brings ruin, a.k.a. there's no such thing as a certainty. Um, so those Delphic Delphic uh, gods, they, they had it right all those many years ago in Greece. Um, in this session, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff which will hopefully help you, help you to... Um, it probably sound a bit preachy. That's not the intention, of course. Um, but it is obviously a, a monologue rather than a conversation and, um, such is the nature of these things. But I hope that within my thoughts, um, there are some takeaways for you that will, that, that will be relatable and that will help you to, um, to kind of think a little bit about, uh, your starting point. And as I said in my email earlier to, um, to maybe press the reset button and uh, perhaps do things slightly differently from the way you do them now. Um, I hope that kind of makes sense. And it sort of leads into the first thing that I really want to talk about, which is um, the art of the possible. Uh, now, I think we all of us bet for different reasons. We bet on horse racing for different reasons from the reasons we bet on football or other sports or speculate on currencies or for um, uh, crypto or whatever. Um, betting on horse racing is not just betting, it's horse racing. And um, there are reasons why we're attracted to betting in the general sense. And there are reasons why we're attracted to betting on horse racing specifically. Um, and I think understanding the fact that we are attracted like moths to a light specifically to horse racing rather than football or cricket or tennis, um, although we may do that as well, is is kind of important because there are certain facets of a horse race as a betting medium uh, that, that, that are separate and distinct from most other betting media mediums. Um, the main one is the, is, is the time it takes for the event to uh, transpire. It, races are run a five furlong race takes less than a minute often. Um, the longest races take 10 minutes, whereas a football match is 90 minutes. A cricket match can be a day or five days. Um, w we get some kind of instant gratification. We get our endorphin hits on a, on a very regular basis if we want them that way. Maybe we only have one better day or one better every few days, but for a lot of people, they, um, uh, they, they, they can't resist the betting from race to race and i think understanding starting point is um is really important so if you have an aspiration to uh make a profit from your betting absolutely fine of course you know i think we we all to a lesser or greater degree have that and i think certainly pretty much all gold subscribers in other words people who are um 
paying for information have that aspiration to to improve their betting and to maybe make a profit um that's a great aspiration to have and it's a perfectly realistic achievable aspiration but we have to do it in stages so wherever you are now on the spectrum from losing heavily to extreme profit um you're not going to get from the the current position to your ultimate destination overnight or in a week or maybe in a year um it takes time and it takes kind of dedication it takes practice it takes um repetition i'm a big fan of uh of the bake-off shows i, I never was that I, I used to say quite rude things about it um excuse me one second but as i've got a little bit uh, more mature let's say um i've become more interested in these uh, amateur enthusiasts um and kind of really impressed by the, some of the spectacular uh, confections that they produce. And I, I, I guess baking is like betting and betting is like any number of other things. Um, when, when we first start out, we're probably not very good at it. And as time passes, we improve. We have successes and failures along the way. And um, one of the most attractive things about Bake Off is some of the spectacular epic fails um, interspersed, of course, with with brilliantly uh, creative and imaginative and uh, tasty designs as well. And that's kind of a good, well, I think it's a good analogy for uh, betting on horse racing as well. And it's kind of like, you know, some days we can we can start with great intentions and have a have a kitchen disaster in the betting sense and other days we can create a, a masterpiece of which we're justly proud um and those who get to eat it with us uh think very highly of it so um regardless of whether it's a good day or a bad day persistence is key learning from the experience is key improving over time is key and so we go on our betting journey as we go on any journey of um learning something improving as we go through practice and repetition and i think having labored that probably quite considerably um the key point is that we need to recognize that we cannot be instant heroes we cannot become uh profitable betters overnight if we're currently losing betters um we need to find an approach that works for us within our constraints and i'll talk about that in a second um and, and we need to kind of understand and be comfortable with the art of the possible, with where we are now and where wh what the micro step is to take us to the next place, which isn't the ultimate destination. It's just the next stop on the journey. Um, I hope that makes sense because that that was a big, a big discovery for me in my own um, betting was that I was trying to do too much. I was always trying to hit home runs um and i was staking completely out of um context with with the horses i was betting uh particularly as i wasn't a, an especially good value judge at that time and it's only over with the passage of time that you uh, and by reviewing what you've been doing and by getting good information and learning how to deploy it that you become better profitable in time and um crucially start to enjoy the journey give yourself a bit of a break um from, from you know trying to hit home runs every day trying to get this this kind of linear uh, let me use my other hand for this camera this kind of linear line from zero to hero um n nothing is like that we we kind of we go up and then we have a regression and then we have a small up and then we have a large down and then we have a large up and you, you know how the chart looks it's not it's not a straight line nothing's a straight line nothing nothing worth having is a straight line anyway um and betting on racing is no different so we're going to have setbacks that's fine uh and we're going to work through those and improve and uh and enjoy 
the journey it's really important and I, I i know if you've listened to me for any length of time you'll know that i labor this quite a lot but um that's because i think it's pivotal fundamental uh is to enjoy what we're doing because if we're not then there are other things that we should be doing that we enjoy more um you know if we want to make a few, if we bet for fun and profit and there's no fun we're only betting for profit and if we're betting for profit we can work for profit we can go and uh, swap time for money um so that's that's how i see it anyway okay let's um let's go forward um yeah one other thing i just want to say about knowing thyself and and i i kind of implicitly covered it already but let me be explicit about it um each of us has to take ownership for our own betting activities there's no we don't blame anybody else here we um the decisions we make uh based on the data we have is mere culpa at the end of the day if i spot something or i think i spot something uh a trainer pattern or a loan pace angle or whatever it might be and i bet this horse at 12 to 1 in the morning and it drifts out to 25 to 1 and runs like a thousand to one shot that's my fault you know it's it's it's, it's no problem i'll go and review the bet afterwards um was it was my logic sound and if it was then great I, i'd probably make the same bet again and maybe next time the horse hardens from 12s into sixes and you know runs a very honest race um we have to be accountable for the bets we make for the decisions we make we the the the, the fundamental difference between using a toolkit like Gigi's gold or any other using information to come to your own decisions uh versus backing the the selections of a tipster uh, and again you know no n no issues with tipsters at all um some really good ones loads of rubbish of course but some really good ones um but when we if if you follow a tipster you are essentially outsourcing the thinking process you are abdicating responsibility you end up kicking the dog more often than you may end up kicking the dog more often than not and none of that necessarily moves you forward in your understanding of the game particularly in your enjoyment of the game um and so that's why i think the process of looking for a bet is so is so important um and why i kind of labor uh at great at great arduous length the the joy of the thrill of the chase if you like and that for me yeah of course i love i love the fix i love the buzz the endorphin hit of watching a race but it's 60 percent that and 40 percent going through the form and, and trying to work out uh trying to find something that's not not fully in the public domain and um yeah that's that that uh, when i stop enjoying that i'll stop betting on horsing H horsing horse racing i don't think that's going to happen any anytime soon okay um so that is the art of the possible um very important to to keep in mind where you are and where the next stage is not always have in mind kind of the end game but but keep in mind where you are and where the next stage is and enjoy the journey from where you are to the next bit otherwise it's wasted time potentially um i wanted to talk about limitations and constraints uh and i've had a few questions on this so i'm probably going to uh, see if i can i'm going to put my spectacles on uh, see if i can introduce um uh, some of this so there was a reference to um a question about could you just provide digests of everything please um there's another question about should you specialize um so let me let me address those should you specialize yes uh but specialization isn't necessarily betting only one group of horses it isn't necessarily focusing only on sprinters or stayers or handicap chasers or all weather horses or whatever it's about um the, the simple honest fact that at the moment every day there's about 50 races and even if you've got even if you sleep for two hours a day 
and you only need one hour to do everything else, there still isn't enough time to go through 50 races in in the kind of detail that perhaps we ought to. Um, so naturally, we have to make decisions about the races we bet. And I think um, one of the most important skills that we can learn as punters is to choose our battles, to choose the right races in which to bet. And then, of course, the question is, well, which are the right races? So um, it will depend on the kind of racing that you like, the kind of racing that you feel you have some sort of a toehold in. Uh, but for me, and as a, as a kind of a purveyor of a toolkit, I would suggest you also think about this. Um, you go, I go where I've either got, I know the most about a race. In other words, handicaps where they've all had a hundred goes, where the form is very exposed um, and the horse with the best uh, draw and pace setup or the best form profile against today's conditions. Um, especially if it's been running ostensibly moderately recently in different conditions, that becomes a very uh, attractive bet. And what you tend to find with those kind of horses is that in the early markets, they're the wrong price. Uh, they're too big a price. And by, by the time the race goes off, the market adjusts um, and people cotton on to, oh, actually, this horse is heavy ground today and this horse has won three out of four in the past on heavy ground um, and has been running OK on good to soft recently. Uh, so, you know, things like that, those are setups that I look out for. So I'm looking, I'm looking for races where there's lots, there's lots in the book already and I haven't got to guess too much. And if I'm going to guess, I want to guess on the basis of a good bit of data and a decent price. So uh, an example of that would be a handicap debutant um, where a trainer does pretty well with handicap debutants. Um, and the horse is a square price, maybe eight to one or whatever, you know, it depends on the setup. But so that'd be, that'd be where I'd be interested. Where I wouldn't be interested is two year old races, particularly, especially not um, kind of novice races, actually not nurseries either. I, I, I can't stand nurseries there. Uh, frankly, they're too difficult. And um, if, uh, you know, some people specialize in them, some people love them, but they're not for me. So um, you need to think about where your strengths are and you need to think about where you've got the most information and some example setups here would be uh, where you can know more than the general betting public and or you can know more than the general betting public sooner than they know it in other words before the market adjusts um, so draw pace setups um, forward forward going horses with an inside draw on turning tracks or low in speed <clears throat> excuse me from any draw on a turning track very interesting um, horses running on extremes of going um, where the horse in question is a multiple winner on on heavy or firm ground that's a very good in um, horses who are proven in big field handicaps like 16 plus runner handicaps is a great in um, uh, Horses proven in the top class is a great in, and um, some of the quirkier tracks, horses with course form at places like Ascot or Hexham, uh, Fakenham, um, Cheltenham as well. These these courses are are kind of unique, and some of them are uniquely demanding. And horses either um, can handle that or they can't. And if if you know a horse can handle it, then th that's a big leg up. Um, so incidentally, those are the, the things that I just exemplified there are the components of instant expert. So, you know, that's a great place to start, especially if one of your constraints, one of your limitations is time. Now, time is something that we all have a finite amount of and um, we all wish we had more of it. And we all probably wish we had more of it to look at horse racing. Um, but whatever amount of time we have got, we can use it more wisely with um, a form book. You know, obviously I'm going to talk about Gigi's, but there are other, there are other products available that offer similar um, 
similar insights. Uh, essentially, if you've only got an hour, or let's say half an hour to look at the racing, you're going to get a lot more insight using Gigi's Gold or a similar form book than you are using a newspaper or a um, <clears throat> or the racing poster at the races or Sporting Life. The problem is that you you um, you have to be accountable for your decisions, and if you're using one of those other um, kind of more lightweight content providers then maybe you can blame the lack of data maybe you can blame them for uh for any failings in your betting whereas if you've got a more comprehensive provision you have to be accountable and i, and I think um um the main the main issue with time is trying to do too much so if you've only got half an hour um use some of the quicker access tools within GGs, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, or focus only on one, maybe two races and spend a little bit of time out of your um, 30 minutes choosing carefully those one or two races. Choose your battles. Make sure, you, um, make sure you've got an edge that you feel plenty of other people wouldn't necessarily have. Could be a trainer edge, could be a form profile edge, could be a draw pace edge, could be any number of things. But make sure that you've got kind of an, an in that other people don't have um one of the other constraints actually before i do that let me do this one of the other constraints that uh, a lot of people have found over time and, and we are acutely aware of this is overwhelm there's just so much going on inside well, in in any form, but but particularly inside gold, I think we've got um, trainer angles, we've got reports, we've got query tool, we've got sectional timing, we've got form profiles, we've got full form filters, we've got drawer and pace and sire data. Where do you start with all this, and where do you stop with it? Um, and the answer to that is, it's up to you. It depends how much time you've got. It depends what interests you. It depends what you feel is relevant in the context of a race. And in the coming seminars, this one is obviously about mindset and setting up to give yourself the best opportunity. Um, in subsequent weeks, we will talk about uh, race cards. We will talk about reports and we'll talk about kind of um, uh, the research tools and pulling it all together. But the race cards are sort of bottom up approach, looking from the trenches up to the sky. Um, the reports are more top down, looking from the sky down to the trenches. And so they're, they're, they're beautifully complementary, but they, they attack the puzzle from opposite ends, if you like. Um, and we will, we'll cover those in uh, some detail and hopefully I'll give you some um, some ins, some setups on the race cards, some ins with the, the reports to for you to things for you to sharpen up on potentially and and to introduce into your consideration. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope you'll get some value about from that in future weeks. I will show you a couple of things today as well, because looking at my ugly mug is going to get a bit tedious. I think um, I try to put some stuff in the background just to uh, make it slightly less when you're getting bored you can try and read the um the race titles in the books there uh and stuff like that so oh by the way what do you think of this guy pretty neat i got him the other day he's um he's the gg's race horse colors and um i have to say he's pretty comfortable as well he's um my uh my my positioning on the chair my my ergonomics is greatly improved since his arrival so that's happy days um race selection is something that i want to talk about race selection is the answer to limitations so if you've got a time constraint or overwhelm the the solution is to choose your races carefully and i'm going to try to go from here to um to somewhere else now oh yeah i forgot about that um hopefully that's just happened i've segued neatly to uh to the chrome browser and um i got we got this today um 
I don't know if it means anything or not. I suppose it's could have been it could have been any other betting site or product, I suppose. So it's good. Yeah, we got um another award. We for the second year we've won um the best betting best horse racing betting product award from those lovely people at Layback and Get Rich. Um so that's neat. That's very good. Um, I haven't even had time to tell you about that yet. So, yeah, very pleased about that. And um, we have had a few awards, which is which is nice. Um, right, race selection. Let's have a look at this. Now, this is a race that I want to talk about in a second. Um, but before I do that, I want to look at this. Excuse me while I put my specs on. So this is tomorrow. These are tomorrow's races. And um, as is uh, as is the way of it right now. There's a lot of racing going on. It's two, four, six meetings tomorrow and two, four, six, seven, six, sevens and 42 plus three, 45 races tomorrow. That's a lot. Um, what I noticed straight away was that the the going for the jumps meetings uh, was soft at both Stratford and Newton Abbott. And I don't know what the weather's like where you are but it's been pretty blooming wet here. So I went to, and this is a place that I recommend you bookmark, britishhorseracing.com slash racing slash fixtures. Um, if you just go to the BHA homepage, britishhorseracing.com, and you'll see the racing um, menu option there. And then if you click on any of the, the fixtures, it will give you a page that looks like this. There's some really good information on here that we, uh, that we share on Twitter. <clears throat> Let me see if I can do this without making a dog's breakfast on it. Let's try. Um, here we go. So, yep. So um, every morning on Twitter, we tweet the going uh, and we also tweet these kind of this information comes from here. So we tweet the any rail movements. Um, uh weather forecast and so on i've just noticed there's an inspection tomorrow so this might be called off and the reason there's an inspection is because the forecast is for more rain and it's already soft heavy in places so it is going to be heavy at newton abbott tomorrow so this was previously soft um showing a soft on the on the default race card the first thing i did because i love heavy ground because it's as i said it's one of those um, it's a setup for me. It's one of those things where I go looking for a runner that that is proven in heavy ground, that's had at least two wins in heavy ground. And so um, what I do, I, my, my, um, I'm going to talk about this more another day next week um, about how I set up Instant Expert. It's not, there's no right or wrong way this is just the way i tend to do it i think two years is the right combination of enough form and recent form um, and i prefer contextual for all and handicap and i prefer contextual for the race code so that's the way i set it up and what i'm looking for um i'm looking for horses that have won on heavy ground because it's a real marmite surface lots of horses can't cope with it um and also lots of horses haven't you know, haven't run on it. So they, they haven't shown they can or can't. Um, but the ones that can, 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 can. So um, in, a, in just a few seconds, I can whiz through this. I mean, this this guy, James St. Patrick, he's 16 to one shot. Um, and, you know, he, he won over the same trip on heavy ground uh, in a big field 10 months ago. His handicap mark is pretty much where it was. Um, so, you know, he, he'd be worth a second look. Tactical Manoeuvre is another one with a heavy ground win to his name, again, in a big field. Again, worth a second look. But I'm looking for those that have had uh, two two wins in uh, in heavy ground. In actual fact, this Nelson's touch, he's had five goes and failed to win. But he did run second a couple of times. Um, and he's one of these that he's dropped a heck of a long way down the handicap. Um they do win, but the further behind their last winning mark they are, 
the less likely they are to win. I suppose that's often compensated by the bigger the price they are. So that's something to bear in mind. But I'm I'm uh, waffling again. What I want to look for is these is the wins on heavy heavy ground wins. So there's nothing in there. That's a novice hurdle. Um, there's nothing in that conditional jockeys handicap hurdle. There's nothing in that race. Now there might be if I put it on. No, there's nothing. Um, nothing at all. Now this one's the interesting one to me, and I just put that back as it was. Um, we actually got two horses of interest here. I'm definitely interested in Bally Breen, as you can see. He has won two out of three and was third on the other uh, start, notwithstanding he was stuffed out of sight. Um, that was over a shorter trip. Um, maybe did, <coughs> maybe, yeah, I'm not really sure. But anyway, he's got two two wins on heavy ground, which is a big plus for me. And you can see that he's got uh, more green uh, boxes here as well. So he's up in the handicap, but he's he's definitely interesting to me. This Crossley tender is also interesting. And in actual fact, I had a little a little bet on this. It was seven to one. Um, uh, it's being back now. This is the one that. Um, it won in a similar size field over a similar trip. This is three and a quarter. This is three and a quarter here. And then dropped back in trip. Um, might have just done too much too soon, but it also carried 12 stone that day, which is a bit of a leveler, even notwithstanding that it carried 11, eight here. Um, so Crossley Tender, I thought was interesting. Um, it hasn't got two wins, but but it has got one. And I just thought the price made it interesting. Um, but Ballybreen is is the other one there. Ballybreen is definitely of interest, albeit at a much shorter price. Um, he's pretty much guaranteed to handle the handle the conditions. So that was that was one of my ins there. Um, and in terms of getting back on point, the point of all this is that in my race selection, the first thing I noticed was that. There was soft ground at two meetings and rain forecast. Now I did check uh, Stratford as well because I was hoping that would that might go a similar way. But you can see it's soft, good to soft there, and the forecast is for light showers. Um, now I would, uh, I might be tempted to go to the Met Office website and look at the weather radar and things like that. And I and I and I would encourage you to do this. It's something that I do. Um, because I, the reason I do it is because I want to know things before other people know them. I want to preempt what's going to happen. Um, and weather forecasting is um, a good bit more, <laughs> good bit more reliable generally than uh, than horse forecasting, uh, notwithstanding that it's imperfect. Um, so, if the Stratford fork, you know, if, if they'd had a lot of rain tonight, more than was uh, mentioned here. Uh, or there was more forecast for tomorrow, then I might set this one up as heavy as well and see if there are any any um, uh, horses that were suited there. So immediately when I see soft ground and a wet forecast, I'm thinking, could it go heavy? And are there any heavy horses that the market hasn't yet cottoned onto? That's a setup I'm looking for. Another setup I'm looking for is um, sprint handicaps around a turn and particularly on the all weather so what i can do with these filters up here so i can just get rid of those two um and then that leaves me with the all weather tracks and then i can change the distance setting to five furlongs um and we've got three races and i can make that handicap as well we've got three races two races now at Southall because i just got rid of the novice stakes um, but they're straight five i'm not i'm not overly um, excited about those but I am interested in this five o'clock race at Chelmsford which is a turning sprint handicap uh, and I'm what I'm looking for is a pace angle really um, so if I set it to the graphic I've got it on the I put it on three there and I've ordered it by draw and um, you don't see this very often at all in a five furlong sprint handicap a pace prediction of <laughs> maybe falsely run um, now, the reality is that it won't be because uh, most of the jockeys are smart enough to know that Chelmsford is a speed favouring track, particularly at sprint distances. And you can see that with this lead bubble here, horses that led in sprint handicaps of this field size at Chelmsford won nearly one in four races 
Um, they're two and a half times as likely to win as other run styles, and they're showing a massive level stakes profit um, of nearly 100 points. So what I would expect is that um, that something will gun for the lead. Now, trying to predict what it is is obviously quite difficult. Um, <clears throat> looking at just the last two runs, Star Chant is the most likely he has a not a very compelling profile overall. I mean, th this is a naught to fifty five. It should be said. This is a very um, moderate race. And looking at win form, there is almost none of it against today's conditions. Looking at place form is slightly more interesting. Um, so we could, we can, if we order this by draw here, we can see that. Edge of the Bay in Indian Pursuit, dear old Indian Pursuit, um, is dropping like a stone down the handicap, but he just gets beat all the time. He was certain to win on Saturday here, and um, he ended up getting collared in the last couple of strides. He's uh, he's a heartbreaker and no mistaking. Um, so I'd be, I'd be against him. He's he, he's going to fall in one of these days, but um, he's just really expensive to follow. Edge of the Bay, likewise, five four three two five two. Um, I don't really like those sorts. The truth of it is, I don't like this race at all, um, and I won't be betting it. But when I talk about um, if I've only got a short amount of time, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to look for my setups. So heavy ground is one five furlongs around a turn is another um, and a third thing that i would do is i'd look at one of the reports and you know we're going to talk going to talk about race cards and reports in much more detail next time um, in the next couple of uh, webinars but i wanted to uh what did i want to do yeah i wanted to talk about um trainer jockey combo now if you only look at one report a day I would suggest that you look at this one. Um, it's kind of a brain dead angle, but at the same time, it's it's sufficiently because of the when you, trainers trainers and tracks is as you know I'm a big fan of that TTS. Um, uh, this is the TTS report page. The the three star uh, horse was a winner today, and um, <clears throat> so this is tra trainer track stuff is is very popular but trainer jockey is is just slightly more esoteric slightly more under the radar and um as a consequence of that um we just we tend to get a just a smidge more meat on the betting bone as it were um just one point about how i set up my reports that, that i i do vary the number of runs i don't bother with win percent i use ae and iv to keep me honest AE is a measure of profitability. Any number above one is good. Above 1.25 is a good um, uh, eliminator of sort of, sort of the wheat from the chaff. Um, IV uh, is a barometer of how often something happens against the peer group. So in this case, how often these trainer jockey combos win compared with all trainer jockey combos at a given um, in a given uh, set. And I set that up at 1.5. Just again, it, it whittles down the number of possibles. So in this particular uh, carefully selected case, we had Messrs. Gosden with Havlin and Bailey with Bass. And they both had 11 from 31, 11 winners from 31 in the last 30 days. And they both added to that tally today. Um, Tao Te Ching uh, won at Nottingham. At a tasty price, and rose to fame one at Taunton at a very tasty price, ten to one and eleven to two. Uh, Drum Ray ran fourth, ran highly respectably, um, so that was a good day for that. The fourteen-day form. Um, let's just get a slightly more realistic number of r runs in there. What did we have here? Gordon Elliott had no winners. He had a 50 to 1, which I would have eliminated, but I'd have been interested in the other three. Um, Kim Bailey's two we talked about. I think Mayfair Pompet might have been a non-runner in the 115. Um, yes, was a non-runner. And um, Tao Te Ching won, and 
Gaelic coast also won. So, I mean, obviously, um, today is a very good day on um, on TJ Combo, 14 and 30 day. But w- what I mean to say is if you're pushed for time, you can set this up with some fairly um, draconian, fairly demanding parameters and you'll have a very you'll have a short list very quickly um, of trainer jockey combinations which are credible and playable um, I also like the course five year uh, view and on this one you're going to need a few more runs let's set that at 25 um, wasn't such a good day for this report I don't think um, that one won a few of these hadn't run when I was looking um, so yeah, it was a, a more disappointing day for the five year, but this is this would be a view that I'd look at often. I think it's a really good source of um, interesting horses, not necessarily winners. Um, you know, again, you if you've got more time, you need to go away and look at other things. But um, there are some all through the TJ Combo stats report. There are some great uh, value options, um, and that brings me nicely see if i can segue back to where we were let's see right hide there i am all right good okay um all right hopefully it's um hopefully you're still with me and it's vaguely compelling um it's, it's very hard to know when I'm, I'm sort of talking to myself here uh, projecting into the ether and hoping that there's anybody there I happen to know I've got a, a little number counter up here somewhere. Um, and it and so I happen to know that there's at least, um, well, it says 168. So, so well played. Uh, thank you. And um, hopefully I'll continue to add some value. The next thing we're going to talk about is odds and the market. And I had a couple of questions here. Um, the first one is about bookmakers versus exchanges and, and which which is the better approach um it kind of depends where you are in your relationship with bookmakers if you are able to get a bet on the night before or in the morning um if you can avail of best odds and other concessions and if you have access to the best price from a basket of bookmakers using odds checker for instance um then i think early price with best odds guaranteed is is definitely uh definitely best um if you don't have that luxury then betfair is definitely uh a good place to go in the 10 minutes pre-race i think between the morning and um those 10 minutes from the opening show essentially betfair is that there's just not enough liquidity there and the prices change and move quite a lot and since the since the sps have been returned and not just the sps returning but the the shows um the pre-race shows from you know five or ten minutes before a race since they've been created by the industry as opposed to on course the nature of that market has changed and it's it's worth being aware of that that changed nature um what we're tending to see is that <clears throat> Um, historically we've judged the the kind of the value in a race in terms of the over round per runner that is the um the percentage margin for the bookmaker per runner um what we're seeing now is that the over round per runner is lower from industry sp in other words ostensibly it's better value but the constitution of that over round per runner is different so what we're seeing now is that the top of the market the the first two or three or four in the betting are tighter are much tighter um and lower down the betting lists uh what used to be a 25 to one shot might be a 40 to one shot now what used to be a 66 to one shot might be 150 and 200 to one shot um in percentage terms it doesn't make a lot of difference but if you hit one of these you're getting double bubble and what it's also doing is it's um it's challenging the exchange because it's it's the market the industry sp market reflects exchange prices much more closely 
than the on course market did. Um, so that's that presents some interesting challenges going forward for on course bookmakers when they're allowed back on track. Uh, it's a it's well, <laughs> I was going to say it's an interesting situation to observe. I think it's an interesting situation. I can appreciate that a lot of people <laughs> will be slightly less uh, excited by it. Um, so anyway, but it is something to be aware of. If you're betting top of the market, then um, your best you're advised if you can to get best odds guaranteed early because they do tend to tighten up those horses at the top of the betting. Um, so exchanges or bookies, if you can get on with the with the bookies early doors, do that definitely if you especially best odds guaranteed. If you can't, then exchanges probably marginal preference. But the gap is narrowing between industry SP and uh, exchange prices. And also, don't forget that there are other, other ways to bet. There's um, tote betting. Uh, you might find a bit of value in a place only bet, uh, betting without the favorite, pool betting. You might, uh, exactors and trifectors or multi race bets um, are something that I've had a lot of joy with and um, both both pleasurable joy and financial joy. So um, don't, you know, kind of mix it up and don't don't be don't be constrained by one bet type with one bookmaker or one operator. Um, OK, that's enough on that. The next thing on the list is discipline. Um, good old discipline. The, um, the fun sponge of betting on horse racing. I've got a friend and he talks about the three Ds. I've probably mentioned this before. The three Ds are discipline, discipline, discipline. Um, and that friend, uh, he did make quite a lot of money out of betting. And he, he used to work with another guy, um, uh, essentially betting in running. And the other guy was on the track and they were on the phone and... Um, uh, they've got they taken advantage of the time delay in the good old bad old days um, before the drones, and the pair of them uh, made a good amount of money from that by using discipline, discipline, discipline. But it was a very tedious way to make a living. He, we used to talk about it, and he, he, he'd have mostly good days, um, but he just wasn't engaged by it at all it wasn't exciting for him so you know um discipline comes at a cost normally it dra drags out some of the fun so there, there are two ways to get around this um the first one is about action bets who doesn't love an action bet i love an action bet i have action bets every day i had an action bet uh, 10 minutes before this webinar started, and um, it was a terrible one. Uh, back to a horse called Goldsworthy, um, who had interesting form, well, good form for John Gosden, was sold cheaply at the last sale, um, and I thought I'd take a chance, but he drifted like a barge and he ran like, well, there's something wrong with him anyway, definitely, um, and hopefully they can correct that and find out what it is. But that was an action bet. It was a very small staked bet because i knew that probably i shouldn't be getting involved um the action bets uh sustain me they they retain my interest they keep me in the game um it's not it's not too often actually that i find a bet that i really want to get stuck into um but every day there are bets that are interesting to me and um you know some of them more interesting than others um very often I'll look at look at my watch or look at the, the time on the computer and say, right, what's the next race? And then just go and have a you know a crazy stab at something for a couple of quid. And um, um, it's it breaks up my working day. It brings me joy and it doesn't impact the bottom line too much. So I think it's really important to to have fun with your betting on racing. You know, when the fun stops, stop. Right. Um, and um I unapologetically am an indisciplined punter, but I but I'm not completely indisciplined. I do it in a in a very um, I'm indisciplined in a disciplined way. If that doesn't sound ridiculous, so when I'm having an action bet, I know I'm having an action bet, and it's a small bet. It's it's not going to it's not going to unpick previous good work 
and nor is it going to um, change my life going forwards. But it is going to give me a bit of a buzz in the short term um, and keep me, sustain me until the next time that I can properly engage. Um, so I would, I would, I would recommend anybody who likes having a bit of action to have a bit of action and, and just be just be aware of when you're doing it and stake accordingly such that it doesn't sabotage the good stuff that you're hopefully doing when you're uh, a bit more focused um, in your selection processes. So that's that. Um, the other thing to say about discipline, this was a question, actually, and I'm not going to read the question. I'm just going to... Um, allude to it uh, as a chap was saying that he had a problem that um, when he was following a system or a service or an approach or a tipster um, after a, a short or it doesn't matter after a, a period of lose, losers uh, he was jumping ship he was going looking for an alternative approach an alternative tipster an alternative system and um he asked me how to deal with that. Um, it's kind of, it's a confidence thing as much as anything else. I think the best way to deal with it is to, to go back and review the reason that you got involved in the first place. What was, what were the promises that were made or what was the underlying logic in the system? Um, what was the historical profit and loss what was the strike rate and therefore what were the average odds um and kind of you know really asked some questions about did you marry in haste and are now repenting at leisure or did you make a good decision and you're just going through a bad run because after a bad run you can expect a good run and after a good run you can expect a bad run um particularly with a proven service and this is why and i've said this before it, it's counterintuitive on so many levels but it's absolutely true that if you find a tipster with a good long-term record who's having a terrible time of it that's if you follow tipsters that's when you should get involved with that guy you should get or girl you should get involved with that guy or girl when they're in the teeth of a downturn because after a bad run expect a good run if the if if you trust the results and the history um, supports it. The converse is equally true. We tend to, we get emailed when a tipster's having a whale of a time. Winner, 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 winner. Oh yeah, but guess what? You just missed all that. And guess what's happening next? Welcome. Um, and that's why if, you, if you're always drawn to a recent run of success, you are probably after the lord mayor's show you're probably closing the stable door after the horse has bolted um so just be aware of that and you know like the next time somebody says their tipsters on fire and they've just back they you know tip four winners out of their last five picks um you can kind of guess what's going to happen next so don't be you know don't fall into that trap um, you might still get, in, get involved but you need to do that in a cognizant way. You need to be aware of the situation when you get involved. And also you need to be, um, I'll talk about it in a minute, but you need to be thinking about staking and banks and things like that if you're following <coughs> tipsters. Um, in actual fact, why don't we talk about that now? Um, I had quite a lot of questions about staking and betting banks. And I hate questions about staking and betting banks because I think it's... Um, Although there's some maths to it, it's quite a personal thing, and um, um, one of the one of the main issues with betting banks is that people are not prepared to let them run dry. Um, so if somebody says, "Oh, you need a betting bank of fifty points," um, the first question is, "Why?" You know, <laughs> what are the maths to support that? Um, and then the second question that you have to ask yourself is, right, if, I set, if I'm going to bet £10 a point, I'm going to need to set aside a bank of £500. Okay, that's fine. But then you have to ask yourself, are you prepared to bet the last £10 of that £500 in the bank following whatever it is that you're following? And if the answer is no, then 
how far into that bank are you prepared to go before you draw stumps? And if it's only halfway, then guess what? Double your, <laughs> double your bank. You've got to be prepared to allow you've got to be prepared to deal with the maths and i'm just going to if i can do this now i'm going to evidence that now this chart here is quite an interesting one it's um it's got three columns the first column is the decimal odds so two is even money 11 is 10 to one um the second column is converting that into a percentage chance uh, which is easy enough basically a um, hundred divided by decimal odds equals percentage chance. Um, and then the third column, which is the interesting one and is partially obscured by the Gigi's logo is losing run. And this is the longest losing run you might expect from a thousand bets. So if we were betting average odds of even money, we might expect to back 10 losers in a row. Um, now ask yourself if you're back in even money chances and you're back five losers in a row how are you feeling about that <laughs> what sort of terms are you on with yourself or with your um god forbid that that's a tipster that you're following um but the but in in that tipster's defense if that was the case we can see very clearly here that if he's tipped a thousand horses he might go 10 picks in a row uh, at around even money and they and they all be losers um so being mindful of the maths is very, very helpful in terms of understanding the kind of things that are going to happen. Um, I, I mean, if you let's say you bet on average, your horses are, are five to one on average. You can see that's decimal odds of six. Um, and you could go nearly 40. Well, let's say you could go 40 losers in a row. How are you going to feel about that? How are you going to handle that? Um, it's very difficult to stay wedded to an approach in the teeth of a downturn like that. But the maths say very clearly that this can, ha these can happen, you know, this kind of stuff can happen. Um, and we've got to be set up for it. So if we're betting average odds of, of, uh, five to one decimal odds, six, we know in a thousand bets. Um, and if we have three bets a day, that's one year in a year, we could have a 40, 38, loser correction and there's nothing to say that we wouldn't then back a winner and then have another 10 losers so we can't you know we have to be mentally strong enough to deal with that we also have to be uh, technically smart enough. we also have to have a chart like this where we understand that this can happen <laughs> this is possible and it's not you know, it's not a terrible tipster or a uh, you know duff data or whatever it is you're, you're not failing with your selection process necessarily um it's just variance it's just a function of large numbers um and i think if you keep in a chart I, I'll, I'll put a link to this somewhere and because i think having a chart like this about um keeps us sane <laughs> it helps to remind us that we're not actually doing we, we there's a good chance that we're not doing it wrong we're just in the teeth of one of these hideous losing runs. And you can see if you, you know, 11 uh, is 10 to one, and you could go more than 70 losers in a row if your average odds are 10 to one. Oh my God, that's brutal. Um, so be aware, um, don't be too hard on yourself when you're backing losers because it can happen. And particularly, actually, um, one of the other things that somebody asked about was uh, the seasons. Um, there are a couple of, as, as most of you will know, but probably not all of you, um, the nature of the, the racing calendar is that there are two kind of crossover sections in the season. And right now is the end of the flat turf season and the beginning of the jump season. And it's a notoriously difficult time to be betting. The other one, you guessed it, is the end of the jump season and the beginning of the flat turf season. And the reason for this is because you've got horses who have been campaigned all season in those in, in the discipline that's ending. Um, and lots of them have kind of had enough. They're 
over the top in the parlance. It's one run too many. And then you've got horses that have got a long season ahead of them um, and are varying degrees of fitness at this stage. So you have to kind of second guess um, whose horses are forward and whose are not. And and I think short-term trainer form, so I showed you on that, um, on the uh, trainer jockey combo report, um, showed you Kim Bailey and... Uh, John Gosden, but Kim Bailey particularly started the season well. Neil Mulhol- Mulholland, easy for me to say, has started the season well. And you know, you can use you can use the short term uh, form on the trainer stats <coughs> report to get a feel for that. So that's I think that's pretty helpful. And definitely, just just know the numbers. Be aware that October um, and perhaps early November as well. It's a difficult time to be betting. Uh, Another factor is the weather, of course, you know, like horses on the flat running in heavy ground, um, horses over jumps running in heavy ground. It's a difficult, there there are a lot of things that are are a bit more awkward at the moment. Um, Plenty of pro bettors ignore, they they kind of step back at this time of year and just let things settle down a bit. Um, I can't do that because I'm a. I'm not a pro better, but I do bet for profit um, with some degree of success. But b. I like the action. I don't. I don't want to be a month with. You know, I've already had two and a half months this year when I couldn't have a bet um, on racing. So I don't want any more of that time. But what I do need to do is obviously I need to be aware that it's a transient period and it's a difficult time to be betting and to maybe rein in my stakes a little bit and to maybe ask for an extra point or two on the price um, to legitimise getting involved at at a more precarious than normal time. Uh, Okay, that's that. Where are we? Ooh, uh, staking and value. Yeah, okay. So, um, oh, just on the betting bank. I'll just put that picture up again. So in in this case, um, how big should the betting bank be? With with with, with this top one, decimal odds two, 50% chance, losing run 10, I would say you should have a betting bank of at least 20 points. Um, basically, double whatever the longest um, expected losing run in a 1,000 bets is, double that number. So if your average odds are six to one that's seven decimal then you'd want a 90 point bank at least and that's assuming that you're prepared to run that bank to zero if you're only prepared to go halfway down it you need a 180 point bank so that you can run it down to 90 points um and and that actually will also keep you sane it's a way to um to manage a bank on your terms like if you don't want to run it to zero if you haven't got the the um the fortitude, if that's the right word for that, then then kind of, you know, do do, do a Jedi mind, tri- mind trick on yourself, kind of kid yourself that you've only gone to halfway by doubling the number of points. Your profit will go up more slowly, but you'll keep yourself in the game. You'll stop yourself from jettisoning, from jumping ship um, in the teeth of a losing run before you have a chance to benefit from the, from the uptick again. So I think it's definitely worth bearing those two things in mind around bank size. Okay, what's next? I need to put my specs on. Excuse me. Increasingly blind. Um, Profiting from gold. Yes. So I've had a few people asking about how do I profit? How do how do other people profit from gold? And how can I profit from gold? Um, it's a really difficult question to answer for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one is that many people who are profiting from gold are not sharing that with me, so I don't know. <laughs> um, the other reason that it's a difficult question to answer is because how other people are profiting from gold may be completely irrelevant in the context of how you bet. They're profiting from gold. They're profiting from their horse racing betting in a way that's entirely congruent with their appetite for risk, their available time, um, their staking, their ability to get on, um, and so on and so forth. And and that might be, that might just not be what you want to, the way you want to bet. So, you know, the number of bets is another one. You can, you can find a, a, an approach, you can find a system that maybe boasts 100 points profit a month. 
but that might be on 10,000 bets. <laughs> Are you happy having 300 bets a day? Some of these scalpers and bot boys, they've got no problem with that. But if you're trying to do it manually, that's a job. That's going to be three hours to get your bets on and three very tedious hours um, and, you know, a huge betting bank to support it and, and various other things. So how person A is making it work is not is quite likely not going to be appropriate for person B or person C. Um, we have to find our own way to make stuff work. And that's part of the fun. You know, that's like going through the tools, finding the bits that appeal, finding the bits that make sense, finding the bits that um, are, are workable in the time that you have. Um, that That's all part of the part of the game. It's part of the enjoyment. And, you know, I want to close um, in the next couple of minutes. And, and I, I, before I close, I want to, one of the things that I think is, it's absolutely crucial to understand, particularly at a time like this, you know, we're, we're living in, in unique times and that's an over, overused word, but I don't think anybody's, um, arguing that it's inappropriate in this case, you know, this, this whole pandemic situation is, is, um, not in my lifetime anyway you know people talk about spanish flu well, i don't know about that but this this is highly restrictive it's um it's having a, a a great deal of negative impact on mental health um you know i'll be an upbeat guy and i've got everything is 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 rosy in my garden i'm very very lucky but still this stuff drags me down it's it's hard not to and people who are you know sole occupants who live alone um it's really difficult for them and it's it's difficult for everyone to a lesser or greater degree right now. So let's just give ourselves a break. Let's not beat ourselves up about backing a couple of losers. Let's try to enjoy the game because um, now more than any time, really, we, we just need a bit of a bit of a diversion, a bit of an escape. Um, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying to win or trying to make a profit, but it really does mean that we should be enjoying enjoying the process, um, trying to improve ourselves, trying to review what was good and what was bad, um, and just basically putting our fingers in our ears and pretending that what's going on outside maybe isn't quite as bad as as, as it as it maybe is. Um, okay, rant over. I hope that makes some sort of sense. Um, I am going to wrap up here. Thank you very much for watching this first episode. Um, I think it's really important uh kind of contextual stuff it's really important for us all to know where we are with our betting and what is achievable and how to go forward from there just to the next level and and then the next level after that comes when we're at the next level if you see what i mean um in the upcoming webinars will be much more about the kit and how that it can help you and i i'm kind of excited about there being less of my face on the screen and more um uh, graphics and data and uh, starting with the race cards next week so i'm very much looking forward to talking to you then thank you very very much to the 150 plus of you who are still here um, you are troopers i appreciate your support and i hope you got some value from this um, i'll check in with all the comments afterwards i i'm as a man i'm unable to to multitask in that way so apologies if you were asking questions i haven't got back to them i will either reply um on email or in the next session. So make sure you all get an answer to your questions. Thanks again for watching. Bye for now.